Great. Well, welcome to Living Hope Church. We're so glad you're with us today. If you have children that are going down for Children's Church, they can dismiss out the back uh, with Miss Melody. If your children are staying with us today, there are activities on that back table that they are free to grab and take to their seat and use throughout the sermon. Uh, there's also um, a sermon notes designed for them back there that they can grab, um, play some bingo, and come see me afterwards, and I'll have some candy for them. Also, we said it, but happy Mother's Day. Uh, we're so glad you've taken time to join us on Mother's Day. And what we're going to do as we celebrate Mother's Day today is we're going to do so by talking about uh, legacy and legacy of faith in our families. We're in the final uh, week of our mini-series on family, and so today we're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 1, if you want to head there. And we're going to look at, be looking at one incredible grandmother and mother that changed the trajectory and left a legacy of faith within their family tree. So in week one of our series, we talked about the foundations of family. And then last week, we looked more specifically at the role of parenting or investing in the next generation. And within last week's message, we looked at Psalm 127. And in that, we talked about how, uh, how Psalm 127 is wisdom literature. And wisdom literature paints a picture of the end goal in order to change how we live today. And that's kind of what we're going to do today from the narrative of Tim Timothy's family. We're going to paint a picture of a family who for generations chose to follow God and see how that affects how we lead today or how we live our lives today. And so as we paint that picture, I want you and I to identify with that picture and to dream of our family tree or the, the tree of people we have invested in uh, to mirror uh, Timothy's family of faith. To leave a legacy of faith, I think that is uh, probably my greatest dream for my family and for my life. And seeing that end goal, dreaming of that end goal, helps to change my actions today and the way I live and the way I act in my marriage and my parenting and the way I pastor and the way I invest my time and energy. So God loves you. He desires to transform your life, and he desires to use you to transform your family tree and the family tree of those around you. Let me just give a simple illustration of legacy for you. Uh, and this illustration is from my baseball life. It's baseball season, and all of the best sermon illustrations come from baseball. Uh, so I got one for you. So a guy by the name of Dave, David Boo Ferris, he grew up in Cleveland, Mississippi. He went on to excel at baseball at Mississippi State University, where he played from 1941 to 42. In 1942, uh, Boo Ferris was drafted by two different organizations. He was drafted first by the Boston Red Sox and then by the United States military. Uh, he played short season baseball for the Greensboro Red Sox before being stationed at Randolph Field just outside of San Antonio, Texas. Uh, but because of his talent, he was allowed to remain on the base and play baseball in the military baseball league. During that same time, another guy by the name of Clark Hitt, who was a chaplain in the Army, him and his family were also stationed at Randolph Field. Clark's son, Harold, was an avid baseball fan, and him and his friends spent nearly every day at the field watching the baseball team practice and play their games. After practice, this guy, Boo, he would spend time, he would spend time with the kids, he would take time to coach them, he would hit them fly balls, he would throw them pitches, and he would set aside all their old broken bats and balls for the kids to use. Well, during those two years, Boo Ferris and Harold Hitt became what would be lifetime friends. In 1945, Boo was discharged just discharge early from the Army because of asthma. And uh, in April of, two, of 1945, he made his Major League debut for the Boston Red Sox. Uh, Boo Ferris pitched 22 consecutive scoreless innings to begin his career uh, with the Red Sox. And that was an American League record up until 2008. He would make an all-star game. He would pitch in the World Series for the Red Sox. He'd be inducted into the Boston Red Sox Hall of Fame. But more importantly for me, he made a lifelong Red Sox fan out of a young boy from East Texas. I'm often asked how I became a Red Sox fan. I grew up in Portland, Oregon. It doesn't make any sense. Um, but my fanhood is a legacy that began with a man from Mississippi taking the time to play catch and write letters to my granddad when he was a little boy on a military base in Texas. My granddad would follow Boo's career until he retired, and by then he was hooked on the Red Sox. That passion was passed on to myself as well as other grandkids, and that legacy continues into the next generation. Unfortunately, my, my granddad passed away before my oldest caveman was born, but caveman's middle name is Williams, after Boo's friend and Red Sox great Ted Williams. And so although they never met, my granddad's fanhood lives on through the naming of my son. It lives on in his Little League team this year, and it lives on night after night on our radio and TV. And we all, we all long to pass on a legacy that lives beyond ourselves. 
And while fanhood, at least the Red Sox, are a noble cause, I think we all long to pass on even more than that to our kids, grandkids, and the generations that may not know our names but will feel our influence. Reggie Joyner wrote, We become so preoccupied with giving our kids an inheritance that we forget the significance of leaving a legacy. What I give to my children or what I do for my children is not as important as what I leave in them. Billy Graham said, the legacy we leave is not just in our possessions, but in the quality of our lives. And so today we're going to read a passage of scripture. It's one of my favorite passages of scriptures that illustrates a legacy of faith, the different forms it can take and how we can, we can be a part of shaping generations for God's glory. So we're in 2 Timothy. We're going to read from chapter 1 and then we're going to jump ahead to chapter 3. 2 Timothy 1, 1 through 9. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying out of my hands. For the Spirit of God gave us not, for the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but it gives us power, love, and self discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. And then we're going to jump ahead to 2 Timothy 14 through 17. Paul writes, But as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know uh, those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this, this, this beautiful story and this story of faith in Timothy's life. God, we thank you for this section of Scripture that uh, just kind of paints that end goal picture of what our families could look like. And God, I pray that as we, as your followers, as we invest in our families, as we invest in those around us, in our sphere of influence, God, we pray that you would multiply our faith. God, we pray that, that many would choose to follow you, Lord, and that their lives would be changed. They would be changed for generations, both in our family and out. So God, I pray that today, Lord, that as we study this passage of Scripture, Lord, you would help us to see ourselves in this story, to see our role. God, that you would help us to see the, the end goal and then change how we live today. God, we may pray we might be people that, that continue legacies of faith and start legacies of faith in our home and beyond. And God, we pray that you would use us to impact the generations. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, I, I love, I said, I love this passage of scripture because it's a real life example of the end goal of legacy that we desire to foster in our own homes. And within the story of Timothy's family and Timothy's life, we, we see clear, three clear roles. And within those three roles, there's at least one role that we can identify with in which God is calling you and I to invest in leaving a legacy of faith. So within this story, I see three different roles. First of all, we have the privilege of being a Timothy or a Eunice. Secondly, we may have the opportunity to be a Lois. And finally, we may be called, and we all are called, to be a Paul. And so the first people I want to look at today are Timothy and his mom, Eunice. In both of their cases, they inherited a legacy of faith, and they were entrusted to make that faith their own and pass it on to the next generation and beyond. In verse 5, Paul writes, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. So for both Timothy and Eunice, the faith was passed on to them, and they had to make it their own and then pass it on beyond themselves. And so for you, that may be your story. You were blessed to grow up in an immediate family of faith or even a generational family of faith. You were blessed to grow up in a home, in a home with generations of followers of Jesus. If that was you, you heard the stories of the Bible. You were taken to church. You saw forgiveness and grace lived out within your home. You saw the teachings and values of the Bible lived out, and you were drawn to the gospel through the teaching and life of your family. If that is you, you are blessed. And you have a great responsibility to not be the limb or the generation that ends your family's legacy of faith. 
And so for some of you, that's your story. You are a Timothy or Eunice, blessed with fam- faith in the family and entrusted to pass it on. So that's our first point. That might be your role. You may be, uh, you grew up in a family of faith and you are called to own your faith for yourself and pass it on. And so the first thing you must do if you are a Timothy or Eunice is make the faith of your family your own. It's not enough to have gone to church as a child, to have Christian parents or grandparents. You have to choose to follow Jesus for yourself. You have to choose to make him your Lord and Savior. You have to choose to make him a priority in your life. It has to become your faith, not just your family's faith. In John 4, Jesus encounters a Samaritan woman at the well. Famous story. She follows him and she goes back, follows him and she goes back to her village and she starts telling everyone about Jesus. It says, many of the Samaritans, in verse 39 of John 4, many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I did, she said. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two more days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. So she goes back and tells everyone, and some believed then, but for many it took talking to Jesus to make that decision to choose to follow him for ourselves, for himself. So there are a lot of people that grow up in a Christian home. They hear the stories of Jesus, but they are like the townspeople, the original townspeople. They've heard the stories, they've heard others' testimonies, but they have never followed Jesus with their own life. And so if you grew up with a Christian home, the first question you have to answer is, have you ever followed Jesus with your life? Have you, made him, have you made your family's faith your own? And then from there, once you've chosen to follow Jesus, you have a responsibility as a Timothy to multiply your faith and pass it on to the next generation. One of the interesting things about Timothy is that his mom was a Jewish Christian, but his dad was Greek and likely was not a follower of Jesus. And so it was up to Eunice and Lois to pass on their faith to a young Timothy. And it seems that was something that they prioritized and they made a part of his everyday life. And I love that because that is an encouragement to you if you are a follower of Jesus and you are a single parent or you have a spouse that is not yet a follower of Jesus. God can and he desires to use you to change your family tree, to invest in others and to point your children and grandchildren to the Lord. It won't be easy just as it wasn't easy for Eunice, but God can and will use your efforts to put him first to change the legacy of faith within your family tree. Trust your life and trust the life of your children to the Lord. Put him first in your life and expect him to move in your family tree, in your spouse, in your children, grandchildren, and beyond. From there, we see the faith multiplied even beyond the family tree. Timothy was a missionary working alongside Paul to see the gospel spread to the known world. He was a pastor and a church leader. He took the legacy of faith from his family. He multiplied it beyond his biological family, and he expanded the family of faith. And so if you're here and you are blessed to grow up in a family of faith, then it's your responsibility to own that faith for yourself, pass it on to the next generation, as well as see the kingdom spread beyond your home or your biological family. For me, that's where I find myself in this story. I am blessed with an extended family tree of faith, and I pray with desperation that my children, and one day my grandchildren, will choose to follow Jesus with their lives, and that that legacy of faith will continue. And I pray that God would use me and my children to not just continue the family of faith in our home, but that he would multiply our influence for his glory and his kingdom far beyond. So if you're a Timothy or Eunice, you've been blessed with a legacy of faith. Make it your own and pass it on. The next person we see in this story is Lois, and Lois is Timothy's grandmother. Lois is the matriarch of the family, and she is the one who began the legacy of faith in her family. So for many of you, you may be here and you didn't grow up in a family of faith or at least not a family of faith that you would want to pass on to the next generation. And if that's you, you have the unique opportunity to be a Lois and to instill a legacy of faith in your family tree. Oftentimes when we're in this position, we look to families of faith and we assume that our family is too messed up to ever be used in that way. But the reality is every family of faith took somebody stepping out and changing the trajectory of their family. In the case of Timothy's family, it was Lois. We don't know a whole lot about her other than she was a first-generation believer who took her faith seriously and passed it on to her daughter and then to her grandson, Timothy. So if you're in that position, you have a chance to be a Lois, to be the Lois of your family and begin a godly heritage in your home. It doesn't matter who you are, what your family looks like like or how bad things feel. God can redeem and change the direction of your life as well as the life of your family. Joe Bloom wrote, if your family is not the epitome of harmony, take heart. God specializes in redeeming messes. 
See yours as an opportunity for God's grace to become visible to your loved ones and pray hard that God will make it happen. If you, read your, if you read the story of the Bible, you read your Bible, it is full of families whose issues make your families look like child play. Yet God uses each of those families to accomplish his purposes. Your family in your life is never too far gone to be changed by God and be used for him for his glory. He can change the directory of your family. God can change the legacy of your family, and he can use you to begin that change. So the second role or the second place we can find ourselves in the story is we can be in the role of a Lois. And God is calling you to begin a legacy of faith in your family. I just love that. I think it's such a beautiful opportunity. I just love this, this part of this story. You have the chance to change your family for generations. And what's so cool about being the pastor is I get to see some of you doing this in your home. And in your family tree, and it's inspiring. God is using you already to change the course of your family for generations. I can think of no greater legacy to leave, no greater honor than to be the one that your grandchildren, children, great-grandchildren look back on and say, that's the person that changed our family forever. A few weeks ago when we began this series, I mentioned my father-in-law. And I mentioned his story just a bit, but I wanted to touch on it again. My father-in-law, Melody's dad, is he's a former church planter. He's a former pastor, and he's currently the president of a seminary. Uh, and seminary is just a graduate school that prepares pastors and missionaries for, and others for ministry. Uh, he's an incredible leader within the Christian world. And when you look at his life, you would assume that he grew up in a Christian home with a leg up, with a legacy of faith. But his familial situation couldn't have been farther from that. My father-in-law grew up with a mom who worked all the time just to keep food on the table and a string of alcoholic and abusive stepfathers. Nellie and I have been married for 10 years now, and I I still have no idea how that side of the family tree works out. But when my father-in-law, Jeff, was a young boy, he went to the county fair, and he walked up to a booth where a local church was doing outreach, and a man shared with him about Jesus, and he accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior that day. Thanks to those people that share with him and some incredible mentors. We'll touch on that in a few minutes. His faith grew, and he eventually became a young pastor. When Jeff came to faith, he vowed to make faith a priority in his future family. He vowed to give his kids a better life than he had, and the trajectory of his family tree was forever altered because of his faith. He grew up in a family of chaos and substance abuse far from God, but God used his faith to change the direction of his family for generations. And God can do the same with you. He can use you to change the direction of your family tree for generations. When you follow Jesus, when you change your lifestyle, when you make him a priority in your home and your relationships, you have the chance to impact generations. What a great and special opportunity you have to make an eternal difference in your home and beyond. I mentioned my great-grandfather in my intro, Clark Hitt. I never met my great-grandfather, but his legacy of faith is being continued. His impact is still felt, even though I never had the privilege of knowing him. How amazing to think God could use you to begin a legacy in your home that would be remembered beyond you. So that may be your story. You may be a Lois. You've come to faith, and God is instilling in you a passion to live out your faith and pass it on to the next generation. Final person or the final role we see in this story is that of Paul. Paul comes alongside Timothy, and he becomes a mentor in his faith. And all of us as followers of Jesus are being called to this role, called to pass on our faith, not only in our family tree, but beyond. We have all been called to share the hope of Jesus with our family, our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers, our teammates, classmates, and so on. We are all called to share the love of Jesus with the world and around, uh, with the world around us. That's our final role that we could be in this story. Uh, God is calling all of us to share our faith beyond our home. John Piper, the former pastor of Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis, said this. He said, Woe to us if we ever become so fixated on the welfare of our own children that we lose our passion for rescuing lost neighbors and reaching the lost nations. We talked about this a lot last week, but one of the the most important things we can do for our children is modeling our faith. And if we want to model biblical faith, we must be reaching beyond our families and investing in the lives of others, grafting faith into their lives as well. Melody and I, we talked about this uh, this past week, and we're just talking about different stories of people who have done this that we know in our life. And one of our favorite stories that we talked about, there's a a couple back in our church in Oregon, and and this couple, they operate a daycare out of their home. 
uh, Rebecca is, is the wife, and she's the primary operator of the daycare. But sh- what she does is she only takes children that are on government subsidies, and she takes these low-income children so she can provide quality daycare uh, to these kids that are often overlooked. But more often awesome than that is she sees this as her ministry, and she models her faith, shares her faith, and she gets those kids to VBS and Sunday school every chance she can. You never saw Rebecca at church without at least a couple extra kids. Uh, back then, Melody was a children's director of this church. It was a large church in, outside of Portland. And so we had Saturday night church. And there was one little boy that she watched named Daniel. Uh, when we met Daniel, he was a second grader, and he had accepted Jesus at VBS, and this boy loved church. And it was so cool because every Saturday night, he would get his little brother and his little sister dressed. He would feed them as a second grader, and he would get them ready to go. Uh, and then he would go, and he would get his mom, and he would make his mom bring them to church. She would drop the kids off at the door, and then he would check his brother and sister into the preschool, and he would go to his class. After church, Miss Rebecca was there, and she would take him home. One of those nights, uh, they were just talking in in Sunday school, and he shared. They were talking about who are the people that tell you about Jesus. And he he told Melody that she and Rebecca were the only ones that have ever told him about Jesus. And that no one at his house did because they didn't know anything about him. But while, and while we were at church, a few times his mom would come, but more often than not, there was Daniel there, brother and sister in tow, making sure they learned about the one true God and soaking up everything they could. This young man's life was changed, and he continues to grow in Jesus because one lady took the time to look beyond her family and invest in his life. I could tell many more stories that, of those that have come to the Lord because of the faithfulness of the Waylands and their daycare and the sacrifices they have made including they they adopted one of the girls in their daycare when her grandparents, who were her guardians, both passed away because of cancer. Lives are being changed. Legacies of faith are grafted in because his family is looking beyond the immediate, investing in others. What a beautiful picture of the gospel to their family and their kids. What a, a beautiful picture of the importance of Jesus in their lives and in their families. I mentioned my father-in-law's story earlier, but uh, where would he have been without these men that saw beyond themselves and their own families and invested in a young boy with nothing from the wrong side of the tracks, from the wrong family, and his life was forever changed. These men took this young boy under their wing, and they became the fathers he never had. They went to his baseball games. They, they took him to church. They taught him what it meant to be a man, a father, and to be a follower of Jesus. They even helped to pay his way through school. And they've continued to be his mentors and have stood alongside him at every milestone in his life. All right, these men poured their lives into Jeff. They invested in him. They spent time with him. And again, their faith is being multiplied for generations, both within his family and with those he impacted along the way. So through mentorship and through investing in others outside our walls, we have the chance to see our impact multiplied in even more expansive ways. There's so many ways we can do this. For, for some of you, it's investing in your grandkids. It's pouring to them and pointing them towards the God that loves them. For others, you need to look beyond that to someone at work, to a neighbor, to a friend. Find someone you can invest in. Another great way you can do this is to use your talents, passions, and gifts you have to invest in young men and women throughout the community. If you're passionate about sports, volunteer and help coach a sports team, even if you don't have a child on the team. Our kids' t-ball team right now is being coached this year by someone from our church who saw the need and said, yes, I'll coach even though I don't have a child on the team. Right? That's awesome. That's showing God's love of the community and, to your, and giving of yourself. If you're passionate about children or school, the elementary schools are always looking for volunteers to come and read with children to, to, to supplement in other ways. Or they're Even more so, they're looking for substitutes in Paris. Find a way to serve, to interact, and to invest in the next generation. You can also do this at church by volunteering and investing in the young people uh, through VBS, through the preschool, through other children's activities. You can invest with our youth group and activities uh, that they have planned throughout the year, but find a way to invest and share Jesus with those beyond your home. So within this passage, we see three different roles and ways we can invest in the kingdom. Uh, And so now we're just going to talk about real quickly how we can practically do this. And none of these are revolutionary. These have all been in the last two sermons. But practical things you and I can do to leave a legacy of faith. Number one, the first thing we can do as parents, grandparents, neighbors, mentors, church leaders, family friends is to spend time, intentional time with those whom we're investing. John Calvin said of Timothy and his family, Timothy was reared in his infancy in such a way he could suck in godliness along with his mother's milk. These women invested their time, they modeled their faith, and they shared the stories of their God from young Timothy's infancy. 
So if you want to leave a legacy of faith, spend time with your kids and grandkids, modeling your faith from infancy. It's never too easy to begin teaching them about Jesus. The best way to instill a legacy of faith is to spend time with your children, grandchildren, and others talking and modeling your faith. Outside of the family, if you want to see your neighbors and friends come to faith, spend time with them modeling and talking about your faith. Paul was Timothy's mentor, and they spent years together. Years together building their relationship, building trust, becoming friends, and studying the word. Paul speaks of Timothy as his son. That's how close they had become. So if you want to invest in someone spiritually, you must be willing to spend time with them. The next thing that parents, grandparents, and friends must do is pray for the one in whom they are investing. Verse 3, Paul writes, I thank God, whom I serve, as my ancestor did with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. So if you want to leave a legacy of faith, you have to pray for those in your life. Paul constantly remembers young Timothy in his prayers. He has invested his time and he invests his prayers. The reality for many, uh, for many of the grandparents, here's your grandkids live a long way off, and that might not have been your choice. But the reality is you don't get to spend time with them, but you can pray for them. The reality is as much as you love your grandchild, God loves them more, and what a great way to trust them to him. Pray for your children. Pray for your grandchildren, your nieces, nephews, neighbors, students, coworkers, whoever else God puts in your life. Pray for their salvation. Pray that they would love Jesus more and pray that God would give you opportunities to share and encourage them. When we're praying for others, think about those outside of our homes. Our hearts soften. Our, our time's better invested towards that person. Our ears are more sensitive. And I believe God honors those prayers and begins working in their lives. So if you want to see people around you come to faith, pray. I think we ought to use this quote last week, but William Law said a prayer, there is nothing that makes us love a man so much as prayer for him. I love that. If we want to be better neighbors, better modelers of our faith, better parents, pray for those in our lives. Number three, aside from Jesus, Paul is the ultimate example of a mentor in the Bible. And I love what he does here for Timothy, and I think this applies to us as parents, grandparents, and beyond as well. And the first thing he does is he encourages growth in Timothy's areas of strength. He says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith to your family. And in verse 6, he says, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. Timothy has this gift of faith. It's a strength in his life. And Paul encourages him to fan the fire under it, to continue to grow in this area of strength, to continue to pursue God. Mentors, friends, parents, grandparents, fan the fire and encourage the strengths of those you love. Sometimes they were really good at pointing out weaknesses, but before Paul gets there, he fans the fire and encourages Timothy's, Timothy's strengths. I know, I, I'm sure this is true of your life, but I know this is something that's been so valuable in my life. Right, I'm a person that is quite aware of weaknesses. And because of that, those encouragements, or those fanning the flames of strengths have been so valuable. Some of those uh, memories that continue to provide encouragement and motivation have come from teachers, coaches, professors, family members who have encouraged my growth in areas of strengths. I think of one particular one. Uh, in seminary, I had to take a preaching class. And when I saw it was a requirement, it became the class that I dreaded and I put off as long as I could because public speaking is not what I enjoy. Uh, but I took the class because I wanted to graduate. It seemed like a good thing. And I got the syllabus and was immediately devastated when 50% of our class grade was dependent on our 30-minute class sermon. So I prepared all semester. I did the research. I found the illustrations. I wrote the sermon. I wasn't excited, but I stumbled my way through the sermon. And I'd never forgotten the feedback I got. My professor was a man uh, by the name of Jim Fitzpatrick. He's still alive. And he said after, he said, Rondi, I know you don't want to be a preacher, but you're going to be someday. And I said, oh, gosh, no. He said, God has given you things to say and the ability to prepare and write them in a way that is clear and that people can understand. He said, continue to prepare and write in that way, and you will become more comfortable in your speaking. He said, I know you don't want to preach, but God has given you a gift. Don't discount yourself. Now, you might disagree with what he said and wish he would have kept quiet. But that's one of those things that has stuck with me and is an encouragement every time I get discouraged and doubt myself. He saw a strength and he encouraged me to develop and grow in it. Parents and mentors recognize strengths. Encourage and fan those strengths you see. I could spend the next hour sharing story after story of people that God has used to point out strengths and encourage me in my life. And I hope you can do the same. Please, number four. After Paul encourages Timothy in his area of strength, he also encourages him in his area of weakness. Now, most of us are good at pointing out and encouraging areas of weakness, but I think Paul's order is pretty important here. 
Uh, so it's important to remember that if when we see weakness, we, we encourage the strengths, and then we encourage the weakness. Verse 7, he says, For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. From what we see in the scriptures, Timothy was a man who struggled with timidity and fear. And Paul takes time to encourage him in that area of weakness. Paul tells him that the timid, timidity that he is so prone to is not of God. It is something he has developed and must overcome. God doesn't make you timid, but he gives you power, strength, love, and self-discipline, Paul says. Foster those attributes and grow in those areas, he encourages Timothy. Now, it takes a long-term relationship to encourage growth in areas of weakness, and Paul has that with Timothy. They know each other so well. They pray for each other daily, and with that respect for one another, Paul can encourage growth in an area of weakness. As mentors, as parents, it's important to encourage growth in weakness, But that can only be done if the relationship and trust is already established. That's why it's so important that we spend time with others, we pray for others, that we encourage their strengths so when the time comes, we can also encourage in weakness. So if you're beginning a relationship with a mentor or reaching out to your child and grandchild, I would not advise starting with action item number four. Don't immediately address their weakness, but get to know them, pray for them, spend time with them, and encourage strengths. All right, lastly, Last thing is we must always point our relationships to Jesus. We must point them to the cross. Apart from the grace of God, we cannot change on our own, and we cannot be forgiven on our own. The same is true for our kids, grandkids, neighbors, and coworkers. Yes, our kids uh, need dads that are present, moms that are nurturing, grandparents that love them, and others to invest in them. But the thing they need more than all of that is Jesus. That's the same thing that is true for your friends, coworkers, children, and grandkids. The only thing that can save them and change them is Jesus. Just as the only reason we are saved, that we have faith, is because of Jesus' work on the cross. Amazingly, we as believers and our relationships are the primary method that he has chosen to spread that good news, to share that hope with others and with the next generation. So we must be faithful to share, but point them to Jesus. An expression you will hear is that Christianity is always one generation away from extinction. Technically true, but maybe a little dramatic, but you get the point. If we don't invest in our next generation, if we don't invest and share with the next generation in our world, then how will they know the good news of Jesus Christ? How will they know of a God that loves them? How will they know uh, any other way than the ways of the world, which are selfishness and temporal and immediate satisfaction? If we want Christianity to grow in our families and grow in the next generation, we must invest our time, our prayers, and point them to Jesus. Point them to the one and, tr- and only, the one and only true hope. I think back at my life, I am so thankful for family members and mentors and servants and Sunday school teachers and kids night volunteers and others who have faithfully pointed me to Jesus. So do that. Invest your time. Invest in the next generation, but point them to Jesus. So as we wrap up, be encouraged today. On this Mother's Day, God desires to use you and to continue to use you to begin a legacy of faith, to continue a legacy of faith, and to start a legacy of faith in your sphere of influence. If you're anything like me, you're quite aware of your shortcomings, and yet God has chosen you and I to tell those we love most about him. Proverbs 13, says, A good man leaves an inheritance to his grandchildren. How great would it be and how changed would our families be if we left an inheritance of faith to our children and grandchildren? So as we wrap up, And as Emily comes, and she's going to come and play for us, where are you in this story? We pointed out three different roles. Where are you in there? Is God calling you to be a Timothy or a Eunice, to continue your faith? Is he calling you to be a Lois and and to start a legacy of faith? And who is he calling you to share your faith to? Today, as we look at that end goal, would you commit to raising, teaching, and modeling your faith to your children? Commit to passing your faith on beyond your immediate family to those in your sphere of influence. Maybe there's someone that came to mind and God is calling you to encourage a strength in them today. To point them to Jesus by pointing out how God is moving in their lives. And then lastly, would you just, if you're here and you have a legacy of faith, if you've come to faith, would you call someone this week and just give thanks to the one who told you about Jesus? Tell them thank you for sharing his hope with you. And maybe sharing how you are passing that on to the next generation. So I'm going to pray for us. After I pray for us, Emily will play. And we'll just take a few moments to reflect on our lives and our story and how God is moving and then how he is calling us to, um, to love and pass on his love to the next generation. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for you, who you are. God, we thank you that in you salvation and forgiveness of sins is available. God, I pray if there's someone here and, and they, they grew up in a legacy of faith or, or maybe they didn't, but they've never trusted you with their lives. 
God, maybe today is the day that in the midst of a, a sermon on family that they choose to follow you with their lives, to experience your grace and your forgiveness for the first time. If there's someone here, Lord, maybe you would move in their lives and call them to faith. But God, I pray for uh, the rest of us here that are followers of you, Lord. I pray that we would be a people that pass on our faith, our love of you to the next generation. And God, I pray that you would move in our families that you would call the people in our families to faith in you, Lord, that they would learn to love you and invest their lives in you. God, pray that from this gathering, Lord, that there would just be branches of faith through the generations, that you would use us to share your hope with the world around us. So God, I pray in these next few moments as we reflect, Lord, that you would just remind us of our calling and how you're working in our lives. Lord, that you would call us to, to action, whether that means be, be, be more faithful in our praying, more faithful in the way we spend our time, maybe be encouraging someone, uh, God, or maybe it's just be more intentional to point people to you. But God, would you call us to action, and Lord, this week would we go and live it out. God, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that you have given us this incredible responsibility. God, and I pray that we would be faithful sharers uh, of your faith in our families and in the world around us. God, we love you, praise you. In your name we pray, amen.